yeah. would be fun to do play tricks on people. <laughs> <laughs> it would be, wouldn't yeah. it? We're just very boring. Yeah. Twins. <laughs> Twins, one of the most perfect natural resources for scientific research. The physical similarities of identical twins have always been fascinating, but it's only in recent decades that researchers have recognised the important role that twins play in research. Although we might look the same or sound the same, like our personalities are totally, totally different. By studying the differences between identical and non-identical pairs of twins, it's possible to untangle the huge and complex nature-nurture debate. We can see how the environment and our genes interact and affect everything from how well we do at school to understanding autism. <laughs> this is the story of TEDS, the twins' early development study. TEDS is the largest ongoing twin study of its kind in the world. It includes over 15,000 families with twins, followed from birth for more than 20 years, providing researchers with a powerful resource to help improve the prevention, diagnosis and treatment of many health issues, understand how and where we live affects us, and helps us know more about our potential and limitations as human beings. Across the globe, more than 100 collaborators are working on projects using data from TEDS. More than 300 scientific papers based on TEDS have been published, almost half of those in the past five years alone. So weird, how many minutes apart were you born? Eight. But she always says respect your elders. Like... <laughs> to celebrate the 20th birthday of TEDS, we'll go behind the scenes, meet some of the twins, and share some of the insight unlocked from the enormous wealth of data created over the last two decades. Why do children differ so much in their progress in the early years at school? Why do some develop certain diseases and conditions and others not? The data generated by TEDS can help us answer many different questions. Without twins, this type of research would be nearly impossible to conduct. The beauty of twin studies is that they provide a natural experimental design because there are two types of twins. First you have the identical twins who are created from a single fertilised egg and so they are genetically identical, a bit like clones, exact same genetic material. Whereas non-identical twins are made when two eggs are fertilised at the same time so they're no more similar genetically than normal siblings are. But of course both types of twins are reared in the uh, uterine environment together and then reared in the family environment together. But one type of twins shares all their genetic material and the other one only half. And it's that distinction between them that we can use because anything that has a genetic influence will show greater similarity between members of an identical twin pair than it will in members of a non-identical twin pair. So then we can compare the similarity for the identical pairs and the non-identical pairs and that then indicates the level of genetic influence on the trait that we're interested in. Since 1998, TEDS has gathered data from both identical and non-identical twin pairs and compared similarities to find out how genes and environments shape our development from birth to young adulthood. Most scientists now believe that both genes and environment play a role in how we develop, but their relative importance is still disputed. Only long-term studies like TEDS can provide hard evidence. The home of TEDS is the Social, Genetic and Developmental Psychiatry Centre, which is part of the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's College London. The SGDP was set up in the mid-1990s and the idea was to be the first centre that brought together research, not just about genetics, not just about developmental psychology, not just about social psychiatry, but bringing all of them together and having a really interdisciplinary approach to studying psychology and psychiatry. Um, and so some leading international figures were brought together to start this venture off and of course one of those was 
Robert Plowman, who came over with Judy Dunn and started the Twins Early Development Study. Review committee that agreed to the funding um, said, you know, okay, but you won't recruit people at anything higher than senior lecturer level. And so I said, well, I'm not in the least bit interested in doing that. Uh, we have to have stars, uh, international stars, uh, because what we want to do requires people who are really creative. The key people at that time uh, were Robert Plowman, a geneticist, um, and Judy Dunn, a social psychologist. And uh, Robert and Judy shared my view very much that we need to bring all these things together. Chicago-born Robert Plowman and his British-born wife, Professor Judy Dunn, have spent a lifetime investigating the genetic and environmental origins of psychological traits. Robert has published more than 500 papers and a dozen books on behavioural genetics. I think the Institute was keen to get Judy Dunn and me to come, and it wasn't phony at all because we were kind of a microcosm of what the centre is. She comes from a social, environmental, ethological background. I come more from a genetics background. So we were sort of... Um, uh, the paradigm in a way, and Mike Rudder saw that, and he, for himself it was quite a big step. He was known as kind of an environmental researcher, but he was realizing then in the 90s that genetics is important. In 1995, Robert set about getting permission and funding to establish the first systematic study of newborn twins in the UK. I'm not fatalistic, but you have to pay attention when things want to work out. So, you know, and, and when I came to England, I just had lunch with this person in the Office for National Statistics. And I thought, you know, sure, I'm going to ask them for the birth records of twins. Well, first it turned out that they were computerized beginning 93, in 1993. So before then, you would have been shuffling through millions of pieces of paper. In 93, it's computerized, and they put on the birth certificate in 1993, whether it was a multiple birth. So that made the searching part easy. And then when we could prove that we could get these twins, about 7,500 pairs born a year, and we decided to go for three birth cohorts, births in 1994, 95, and 96, so that would be on the order of 21,000 pairs of twins. The MRC came through right away with the money for this in, in 1995, and that's how the project began, and the MRC has continued to fund it for 20 years. People from North London who brag about never coming to South London don't realize there's this huge research empire here. We have some brain stuff going on down here, genetics, molecular genetics, there's DNA stuff over here. And bringing that together with psychiatry, there's no one who can be expert in all those things. It requires an interdisciplinary approach with people who want to collaborate with each other. Did you know that the world record holders for the oldest living twins are 103 years old, Evelyn and Edith Rennie? and it's actually a myth that twins skip a generation. I think we respond to situations differently and we have different interests and different hobbies. Like she's really creative and stuff and I'm just more academic. Can't draw or she can't draw. I really can't draw, so. So the early part of TEDS was about understanding how cognitive and language development link in with emotional and behavioural development over those important preschool years, two, three and four. And we did something really innovative, actually designed our own measures of cognitive and language development that could be done by the families in the homes themselves. So they became our testers and nobody had ever done that before and it was really exciting. And um, we got an enormous amount of data. When you think about how busy families with two, three or four year old twins must be. I mean, I have children quite close in age and I really take my hat off to them all for managing to fit it in. I asked mum why we did it and she was like, oh, it was in the pack when I knew I was having twins because she didn't know till quite late on that she was having twins. Yeah. We got a little Ted's t-shirt and it's got baby twins on and that's just the size of it shows how young we were when we got them. But we I think the earliest memory of Ted's was when we were doing the um, DNA swabs at home and our dad had to convince us that it wouldn't hurt, that it was just going to tickle and it would be fine. Yeah. 
So we sent them booklets with um, little bits of equipment to use to, and things that they should ask their children to do. And we got great data out of it about how their um, language was developing, about how their um, general cognitive ability was developing and about emotional and behavioural um, expressions that they were showing and then looked at the links amongst those and looked at the influence of both genes and environment on each of them independently and on their lo links together. So this is the four-year study and essentially we're looking at um, some visualization measures so we're looking at the twins abilities to find um, pairs of images that are identical and of course it starts off with quite simple um, pairs be it find the two squares, find the two triangles. As they became older, the twins themselves were able to complete the tests. I remember the first heads we did. Got to of school, to get paid. And, and we never got, like, there were toys and, and then you could choose the toys or, like, the money. And both of us just chose the money all the time. So it sort of shows what people were like. <laughs> They've been with us since we've been small. They've given us home visits. Um, they're kind of... Always part of our family. Yeah, they're always with us and, um, and they never forget our birthdays. We're always getting a birthday card from them as well. I remember having to, to do one where I'd have to look at like eyes, but just eyes, and try and work out what emotion they were expressing. Oh, that I was thought, so difficult. Right? It was so hard, wasn't it? They ask us how much alcohol we drink each week. They ask mm. us if we smoke. It, it varies. Well, we don't smoke, things. but the alcohol varies. Ted's families have taken part in studies at regular intervals throughout their lives. And tests for smaller groups are added all the time. Over here we have um, some ladies doing the mailing. So we have a mailing out that's coming for uh, Ted's BRICS study. We want to know whether spatial rotation and spatial visualisation are different or the same abilities and whether they are different in 2D or 3D environment. We're sending out 4,000 of these to the twins and uh, they're going out this week. The TED's database is vast. Over here we have our data manager, Andy, and so he's really responsible for collating all of the data and accessing all of the information that we have from over 20,000 twins. So really without um, his input we couldn't, couldn't do what we do. Individuals in the data set are not identifiable in any way. Dates of birth and names are removed. Each family has an encrypted, unique identifier. We were kind of exposed to like another pair of identical twins. We got like latched onto, which at, at the time seemed completely like normal, but now in hindsight, it must have looked a bit odd to people. And because um, our mum's identical twin as well, so that made it that made it actually a lot better, I think, growing up because she she kind of had a little bit more of an understanding of what, how, not how twins should be treated, but what, how to avoid coming across as being like the identical or same person. So we were always kind of dressed reasonably differently and things. Yeah, it makes me kind of cringe thinking about having, having to like swap clothes and things like that. We are exactly the same taste in music, yeah. the same taste in clothes, the yeah. same taste in TV. Yeah. So like we said, we share each other's clothes because we just, have the same fashion sense. <laughs> so if I see something on Tasha, I think, oh, that looks really great. Can I take it? Well, it's normally the other way. Yeah, Tasha totally comes and raids my wardrobes and says, can I wear this? Can I take this? Can I take this? It's like a shopping trip when she comes around yeah, my house. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, same music. Same music, yeah. yeah. If Tasha made a CD, I'd be like, oh, can you make me one as well? Because we like the same things. No, it's quite handy, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. TV no. watches the same. We're both into all that cheesy, the only way is Essex, Made in Chelsea. Geordie Shaw. Geordie Shaw. <laughs> that all that sort of stuff. We both love it. Yeah. <laughs> Although the so-called nature-nurture debate has been going on for a century, TEDs and many other studies around the world have made it clear that nature, or genetics, plays a very major role in education. During its 20 years, TEDs has contributed a major shift towards recognising the importance of genetics in the development of differences between children in their learning skills and educational achievement. TEDS has found that genetic influence is not only significant, it's substantial, often accounting for more than half of the differences between children. The twin study could show that children's educational performance is all environmental. Genetics has nothing to do with it. I'd be happy with that because the embarrassment for us is that so many things seem to be so strongly genetic. 
But, and in fact, educational achievement in the early school years is one of the most heritable things around. More heritable than intelligence. About 60, 70 percent of the differences between children at seven, when they're just learning to read, are heritable. That is due to genetic differences between the children. Which I found is astounding, because I would have thought early on it would just all be due to how much the parents worked with the kids to get them to read. We studied phonics. There's a test called the Tower, um, which is a test of word reading recognition. You read 20 words that were calibrated for seven-year-olds, you know, that they should know what they are, bee, cat, dog, and 30 non-words. And these non-words are phonetically possible words, but the only way you could get them is if you, geb, G-E-B, for example, you have to sound it out phonetically because you've never seen geb before. And so this test takes four minutes, you know, two minutes and two minutes, and it was one of the most highly heritable tests we have. It's about 70% heritable, meaning the differences in children's performance are due to genetic differences between them. People make a big deal about these familiar words, which are supposed to be automated cognitive processes, versus the non-familiar words, which are supposed to be completely different cognitive processes. Well, we can show through a technique called multivariate genetic analysis that it's the same genes that affect these two things. They're both equally heritable, and it's the same genes that are involved. More recently, Ted's published papers on the genetic influence on GCSE exam results in the UK. Remarkably, Ted's found that all subjects, from science to humanities, showed equally high heritability. I gave these lectures at the Department for Education, and that convinced me that I should really focus on impact of these findings. And so I gave talks at educational conferences and summer festivals and that sort of thing. And that's when our first paper on GCSE scores came out. Not surprisingly, based on what I've been saying, GCSE scores were very highly heritable. About 60% of the differences between children was due to genetic differences. I wanted to package that in a way that would get publicity, so I went on talk shows. I gave lectures at the Department for Education. I got into a bit of a hoo-ha in the media, for example. So these things all kind of came together and got a lot of attention from all the major newspapers and um, TV programs on science, several documentaries, and it, it really made a splash and it got people thinking about genetics and educational achievement. These findings could have far-reaching impact as it shifts how people, from policymakers to parents, think about what makes us who we are. One of the things that you always get asked from educational uh, types, and including the Department for Education, is well, what are the policy implications of finding genetic influence? And it's usually assumed that it's all bad news. It means it's sort of a right-wing agenda or something like that. And my main message is there's no necessary policy implications of finding genetic influence. You could, for example, be, have a very right-wing perspective and say, based on my values, what I think is there are these very bright kids who are going to do really well. Let's put a lot of money in there and give them the very best opportunities. Educate the best and forget the rest, it's been called. But actually, you could have a left-wing perspective, which is called the Finnish model, for example, where you say some children at the lower end of the distribution are going to have a lot of trouble. They're not going to really participate in society unless they can reach some minimal levels of literacy and numeracy. They're not going to be citizens, they're not, you know. So let's put all the resources that we need into making sure everybody reaches some minimal level of literacy and numeracy. So based on your values, you can take these data and have very different um, policy implications. The essential message of genetics is that children are different genetically. And so that suggests that a more personalized educational system is a good way to go. These issues are discussed in a book on Ted's findings called G is for Genes, What Genetics Can Teach Us About How We Teach Our Children. It's been written by Dr Catherine Asprey, whose PhD dissertation was based on Ted's. The goal of the book is to start a conversation about the role of genetics in education. 
Another important direction for TEDS in the next decade will be to move more into genomics, by which I mean looking at the genome, the actual DNA. Chef scratch. Traditionally, DNA extracted from white blood cells used to come from uh, blood. It's expensive, also it's quite an invasive procedure. We can now get uh, high quality DNA from saliva samples uh, where the participants can spit straight into a tube. So these are our DNA collection packs. Um, we've actually sent these out to approximately 5,000 TEDS twins in order for them to collect their saliva into this packet and then they'll send it back to us and we process it downstairs in the labs in order for us to sequence their DNA and run a number of studies looking at learning and various um, cognitive abilities. So once the samples are received into the lab, they then get scanned into our uh, lab sample tracking system where they then put into racks, uh, batches of 72 samples and then they're brought forward for DNA extraction. An average study now will involve 500 to 1,000, and manually we can't do this kind of work anymore. So we have to involve robotics and automation. The machine behind me will do a lot of the basic diluting, sample transfers. The DNA uh, we put in, it gets chopped up into uniform chunks. They are then uh, transferred into new, uh, smaller barcoded tubes and racks, where they can be stored in a freezer at minus 80 degrees. Combining this new molecular information with the 20 years of traditionally gathered twin study data takes TEDS into exciting new territory and will help to speed up the process of applying new developments in basic science to everyday aspects of life, including education, health and well-being. With a chip the size of a postage stamp, you can measure millions of these DNA differences between people. And it's now very cheap, say like 40 pounds or something like that, to do this. So that's revolutionized genetic research. Modern genotyping machines, like we have here, they can scan a single sample for 900,000 probes in roughly about a half an hour. Being able to have this DNA to back up the data that's been collected it's, um, it's an amazing, valuable resource. Because we have this twin method, we can get at the bottom line of genetic influence. Whereas the DNA studies start way down here at DNA sequence differences. What we want to do is to go on and identify which bits of genes across the 23 pairs of chromosomes to identify the specific DNA differences and trying to pin down the biological processes that might be involved. That'll change everything. We'll begin to understand how those genes affect cognitive development. The TED's legacy really is the breadth. There's a real focus on developmental psychology, cognitive and language development, educational outcomes, mental health in terms of emotional health, behavioural problems. And we also have a lot of information provided by the families about the environments that they live in, their family dynamics, about how they collaborate with one another. And all these variables can also feed into thinking about the cognitive and language outcomes, the educational outcomes, and the emotional and behavioural outcomes. And so it's the richness and the depth and breadth of that data over such a long period of time. TEDS is also the perfect natural experiment for looking at environmental effects. How we live and what we experience can affect how we perceive ourselves and our many different life choices. From subtle differences in personality to gender identity, our sense of being a man or a woman. I think at the back of my head I've always known. Mm. I've always known you, you were Forever. different. Mm. <laughs> but I, it's, it's nice now he's actually said it out loud and we can just get on with it. Mm. So it was no surprise? No. Um, I, think, I think for mum it was kind of like a, are you sure? Are you, are you really sure? Are you sure? I love just like, mum, think about it now. You've got a boy without getting pregnant again. What? <laughs> she got the best of both worlds kind of thing. I think he's a lot more showy, I think. Showy. Just maybe a lot more out there, extroverted. Yeah, I, mean, I probably agree with that. And like, well, I mean, I mean, maybe you wouldn't use the word showy. Um, <laughs> well, maybe I would, I don't know. <laughs> um, no, I think like, because at school, you were always the cool one. Oh, you definitely were. That's right. <laughs> no, you definitely, and I was always more the like, I was Jay's brother. <laughs> 
we did a perception study, was it this week? Um, mm -hmm. But I like now you can see your results it, like uh, straight afterwards and you can yeah. see how you did. And we were like comparing like, oh, how's he doing? You were comparing. <laughs> I believe that Robert is one of the most exciting and innovative psychologists alive today. There are a lot of people doing research on twins, but Robert really passionately believes about bringing those messages to the broader field so that it's now well understood in developmental psychology that it's not genes or environment, it's both. It's now well understood that the interplay between genes and environment is just as important as thinking about one or the other. I really think that Robert's work and the publishing that he has done and his numerous thought pieces across the years have been very influential in encouraging um, developmental psychologists around the world. <laughs> the whole goal of medicine these days is not to just have dramatic interventions and therapies after someone has a problem like schizophrenia or obesity or depression. It's to predict and then to intervene to prevent. Because as my mother always said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And it's really true. We're not very good at curing things, you know, like alcoholism or schizophrenia. But if we could predict and then intervene to prevent, we might be able to have more of an impact. And TEDS is the ideal framework for that sort of work. Another very valuable aspect of TEDS is that it's providing this huge resource for any academics interested in the type of data that we've collected for years to come. And it, it's really not at all uncommon for people to contact Robert and say they're interested in a particular aspect of the data and they would like to look at that. Somebody contacted me recently and said they'd like to look at the health economics of um, moving into the workforce and how that varied as a function of the choices that that individual had made for their A-level subjects. So a completely different project from the sort of thing I'm normally involved in, but a really interesting a novel use of the data. There are so many reasons why it's important for TEDS to continue that it's hard to even explain them in a short enough amount of time. But probably the main one is that it is one of the best studied groups of twins in the world today. We've been in contact with these families who've been so generous with their time since these children were 18 months old and they're now starting to turn 20 and we have information on them across that full period of time and now they're just reaching that important transition into adult life. We want to study what's called emerging adulthood. This period that used to be a short transition from education to work and family, which has now become incredibly elongated and with sweeping demographic changes in economic patterns where you don't just get out of school, get a job for life. And we're interested in how genetics and those new environmental influences, what the interplay is during this now long period of development called emerging adulthood. Now we could do that in a new twin study, but the real value of TEDS is we can now look back at predictors, environmental, genetic, behavioral predictors from the first 20 years of life. For me personally, another really important thing is to think about moving into the next generation of TEDS. So starting to collect data on the children of these TEDS twins as they move into parenthood because that will then be the first time in the world we have a data set where we have the same data on the adult twins from when they were the age they're now reporting on their child being. So we could have data on two-year-old children of our adult twins and we can look at that in the context of the data reported by the twins' mums when they were two and that will allow us opportunities that have never been possible before. The project just becomes more and more valuable as time goes on. As it grows, TEDS will continue to provide new, exciting and important discoveries to help us better understand how we learn and can best educate our children and provide new information for basic science and the prevention and treatment of many different mental and physical health problems. None of this would be possible, of course, without the help of the 10,000 families of twins that together have contributed to one of the most powerful scientific resources in the world.